Hi everybody. We are we are here doing a redo. It's uh, it's 9:30 on Sunday night. I did this last night, and it didn't save. And so I'm starting again. And we will. Hi hi. Um, we're. I'm gonna try to actually keep this to about 40 minutes. And I've gone over all the different questions that. Um, everyone has sent in and I'm trying to what I what I'm actually going to do is is kind of condense it a little bit and not be um, not not be as um, wordy I'd like to try to really give you some practical information and advice and support and chizok, which is another word for support to try to get through this time so I think, you know, I'm just gonna wait another minute or so and wait for a couple of people to join. But um, firstly, I just wanted to dedicate this session to, um, to the brother of a dear friend of mine um, who is in the hospital right now. He's about my age. He is intubated, which means that he has a tube in his throat um, and that tube is helping him breathe and he's extremely sick because of the coronavirus. His name is Menashe Dove Ben Rasha Riva. Um, we in the Jewish community, um, when we're praying for someone who's sick, we tend to use their Hebrew names. And we also um, tend to, what we say is we say their Hebrew name and then we say Ben or Bas, meaning son of or daughter of. And then we, um, we mention the mother's name because we know that mothers, um, and this ties in directly to everything that we're all going to talk, that, that I'm going to talk about this evening, we know that mothers have, women in general, mothers have natural empathy and they're the ones who um, children turn to in times of trouble and in times of need. And so we're hoping that God will um, listen to our cries and invoke sort of the cause poor connection. Not sure what, what's going on here, but we'll, we're doing our best. Um, we, um, we're hoping that, um, that God will remember this person, um, and invoke, um, um, the feelings of motherhood. So, um, it's Menashe Dove Ben Rasha Riva is his name. Um, I'm just going to actually check the connection because I really want to make sure that, um, this is working, um, right now to make sure that this will be saved. Um, because I did have an issue last night, so I'm going to just pause for a second. I might have to jump off, but I will come right back on. Let's see if this works. Hold on a second, guys. Okay, um, everything seems to be fine, so I'm hoping that we're just going to continue on. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is a few different topics. Um, one, um, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, why their recommendations have come out about um, um, suggesting that fertility clinics close. Um, two, just the general thoughts and the general pieces about how different people are reacting to this process, whether you're grieving because of a loss or you are in the middle of an adoption or surrogacy process, or you know your family just doesn't understand why you're upset and why, why, um, why and they're just trying to survive with with their basic needs and getting food and getting medicine and staying home and they're not under, under, understanding why you're grappling with other sort of the, what they view as higher order problems um, that'll sort of be the second topic the third topic I'll talk about is sort of the coronavirus baby boom jokes or the so lucky you're so lucky that you don't have kids at home or you're not stuck at home with kids. Um, I'll address that. I'll also address the um, you know what happens when different people are reacting to this exact situation differently. Um, for example, if you know you and your husband or I again maybe there are men who are listening now you and your wife or, or your partners are um, really reacting to this situation differently, whether it's um, uh, whatever the reason is and how to be sensitive to the fact that other people are grieving or processing emotions differently. Um, and then lastly, we'll sort of close with self-care and different aspects of self-care and um, 
things that we can do to try to help bolster ourselves in this time of stress and anxiety. Um, if we have a little time, I'll go into, some people have asked me to go into more of my journey, uh, but I really wanna keep this to about 40 minutes. And so um, let's just jump right in. Um, you know, last week, you know, so the first topic was talking about the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and why the recommendations came out um, about uh, telling fertility clinics that they really want them to shut down and not go forward with any um, new IVF processes, um, any new investigations. Um, if someone was in the middle of a cycle, they could continue, but other than that, um, really to uh, shut down and to go for absolutely minimal um, contact with patients and to really just um, move to more of a closing type of environment. And I think that this is for two reasons. The, the first and foremost primary reason that I've heard over and over and over again is, is that we just don't know enough about the coronavirus. We, um, this is a virus that has been around really only for a few months and there are still lots of things we don't know. Things like um, how quickly it spreads, things like um, how long it lives on certain surfaces. There are lots of different things, like maybe it lives this many hours on cardboard and this many hours on aluminum or this many hours on this. But I, I've seen about five different reports of five different, you know, five different um, time, time um, uh, lapses on cardboard. Some, some have said that it lasts for a day. Some have said it lasts for hours. Others have said, you know, for many days. So it's, and this is just one example about how just information is not very good right now. Here's what we do know. What we do know is that this illness is extremely contagious. We know that it's spread by these respiratory droplets, these droplets that come out when somebody sneezes, when somebody coughs, um, etc. And we know that definitely the older population is one that's very much at risk. And there are lots of doctors that are in that older population um, that fall under this category. But the reality, and we also know that those with underlying chronic illnesses, specifically respiratory illnesses, illnesses in the lungs or the heart or other kinds of um, severe chronic illnesses, um, those are the ones, the, the, um, the individuals who are more at risk. However, what we also know, and the thing that's making um, everything so scary right now, is that there are lots of news reports out there um, talking about how there are lots of young people who are under the age of 60 with no underlying medical problems who are also getting very, very sick. And that's terrifying for all of us. It's terrifying for me. Um, it's terrifying for everyone. And so in this kind of a situation, in this kind of environment, where we're seeing people around us all the time on the news and in people in our families, at this point, I think there's really only one degree of separation between anyone who's sick at this point. We all know someone who's sick. Um, and so what the, the reality is, as painful as it is, for all of you who are suffering and who are desperate to start a family or to build your family or to continue to build your family, the reality is, is that these are not vital medical procedures right now. We're in a situation where this is a pandemic and it's about life or death. Yes, I know for all of you who want a child that for you, having a child feels like life and death. You want a child desperately. I know that and I get it. But I think we, in, in the same way that doctors and the medical community are telling people, please stay home. Stay home because you, even though you may not have symptoms, you may be passing it on to others who will get sick and those people will end up, some of them will end up getting very sick. And so we all, as a community, as a human race, have a responsibility to stay home as much as possible. And so what that means is that all of the things that are not absolutely vitally necessary, things like food, things like medicine, things like 
um, you know, social care in terms of um, government care in terms of police and government and um, garbage collection and mail, you know, those kind of vital services, those are the things that are important. And for the people who have those jobs, then those are important. And the people who have medical jobs who are day to day taking care of life threatening illnesses, specifically this illness or other illnesses, those are the jobs that are important. Fertility medicine right now is not life threatening. And therefore, we as a community have the responsibility to stay at home as much as possible, to not only save ourselves from getting sick, but also to save our doctors from getting sick and also to save the general population from getting more sick. So I hear you, I hear you. It's, it's terrible, it's awful. I, I've gotten message after message of people crying, of people wailing, of, you know, my feed is filled with lots and lots of people who are absolutely bereft over this news, and I get it. But I'm asking all of you, I'm the first one who gets it. I've been there, and I know. And if someone took that piece away from me, when I finally thought that this was the thing that was gonna help me to complete my family or to have my family, if someone took that away from me, I, I, I'm not sure what I would do, honestly. I, I would be bereft. So I get it, I get it. But I'm asking all of you, I'm pleading with all of you, please, for the sake of the human race, for society, for whatever country you live in, please stay home, stay home, stay home, and let the people who are taking care of those who are desperately ill, let them continue on doing what they're doing, and the other people who are not um, vitally needed for this specific piece, let them stay home or contribute in other ways to the medical situation. Um, look, someone just wrote in, she just said, I've been working on starting treatment for 17 months and this month was supposed to be my first month. <sighs> I hear you, I hear you. There's nothing for me to say. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just asking you and I'm asking all of you, just step outside yourselves a little bit and just try to put yourselves in the people's shoes who are saving people's lives every day and do your utmost to stay home and to save people's lives. Thank you. Yes, it is awful. It is awful, someone just said, it's awful. Look, I have, I, let, let me tell you, let me tell you about all the people who are upset right now, okay? I, this is, this gets into my next point. I'll just give you some of the messages that I've gotten. Um, one, we were almost at the end of an adoption process, just about to fly next month and go meet my daughter. And now, not going. I have um, another one who just said, who said in her message that she's dealing with a tremendous amount of guilt. She feels guilty, that she's feeling sad, over her failed IVF cycle and worried about when she's able to try again with everything else going on. It feels so trivial, but she's so upset. Um, I have, you know, Tamar who just said again, um, who's the one who was supposed to start treatment next month. She said, or this month, she said, she went on progesterone and it's physically and emotionally very painful. Yes, I know. And now, She's in a fake and unnecessary nida, meaning that she's bleeding. And we all know um, when, you're, um, when, you're, when you're observing the specific Jewish laws and related to um, ritual purity, um, when, when a woman is bleeding, then she's not allowed to be with her husband. And so it's just, it adds sort of insult to injury. I, 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 there are a million ways my heart is breaking and it just continues to break over and over over again. Um, I have, you know, I have this, this another message from someone who says, my parent, my family just doesn't get why I'm upset. They're too worried about my grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's it's just there's there's no room in people in their in their minds right now to deal with the emotions of fertility and or or a failed process or with someone who just lost a baby or can't complete with can't complete her process because people are dealing with life and death death issues as i said for the elderly population this virus is awful for them awful for them um and so i i'm not saying to you that you should discount your feelings the person who wrote this you definitely should not your feelings are valid anyone who is grieving over their own situation your feelings are valid you are allowed to have those feelings even though other people in your family are worried about more significant things like grandparents or getting food or getting other things you're right um but you are allowed to have those feelings and i think what you can do is you can say to your family or choose one person in the family who's your confidant and what you can say to them is listen i know i'm worried about grandpa too i'm worried about Zadie. i really want to make sure that we're all taking care of him and making sure he doesn't go out but don't forget about me i'm still grieving too i'm still grieving too and remember that thing that just happened to me and and i'm just begging you in the midst of all this if you can just check in on me you know every few days and just tell me you're thinking about me um, i think that that's really important to state your feelings and to tell people how you feel so that you don't feel that they're constantly shutting you out um you know, a couple people wrote in here, they said, their fi- one woman wrote, Margot, um, that she's feeling pulled in both directions as she's dealing with re- repeated pregnancy loss, but also that her doctor, her husband is an ER doctor. She has so much fear. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Recurrent pregnancy loss, repeated pregnancy loss is petrifying, petrifying, petrifying. That's life or death too. And yet your husband being on the front lines of being an ER doctor and seeing all of these sick patients all the time and the fear that he must carry with him and having to try to help these people all the time and then coming home to you, it's its all hard. It's all hard. Um, someone else wrote, um, Ariel, that this is horrible times, but Rachel Imenu, our our um, our mother, Rachel, you know, we have um, in our, in our, religion in our culture we have um we have the four mothers we have sarah sarah rifka rebecca leah um and um and rachel and and or, or rachel and ariel is saying that this is horrible times but rachel rachel was the one who didn't have any children um after she saw her sister have child after child after child after child so many children and she said it was an embarrassment to herself that she didn't have kids and she felt like she was dead. Yeah, it's true. I think the, the only thing that's different here is that we're in the middle of a pandemic and even though she felt like she was dead, she wasn't actually dead. And I know that this is gonna make some people very upset. I am legitimizing and validating all of your feelings I'm just, what I'm trying to give to you is a framework and say, let's talk about it. Let's be sad and let's, let's bemoan our fate, but also think of the big picture and say that, thank God we are all alive still. And we are, we have to focus on big picture here and put ourselves a little bit out of our own box. I'm asking all of you and I'm begging all of you. Um, okay, so look, I'm getting these messages and I'm getting these messages and all of you are struggling and I get it. Um, what about the, everyone else who's struggling and they're also like, you know, you're also getting from your friends, your relatives, your, your neighbors, or you're seeing it on social media or people are joking about it in the news and they're saying, oh yeah, you know, can't wait to see what happens in nine months because there's going to be this big baby boom or, um, your all your friends or your family members who do have kids and they're saying oh you're so lucky 
you don't have any kids right now, so you don't have to worry about you know scheduling them and dealing with temper tantrums and not able to go outside and staying home. You only have yourself to worry about, so it must be so much easier for you. And that's just like a dagger in your heart over and over and over again. This is what it is. Look, this is the same, I, I equate this, this is actually what I said last night. I equate this to all the difficult comments and all the, the nasty and mean comments that people make that I don't believe are, people are not trying to hurt you. They're not trying to hurt anyone. They're just, they're talking about their own experiences and they don't realize that those words are gonna land in a very different way to your ears as opposed to someone else. And they're complaining to you about their own situation or they're making this big joke, ha ha ha, you know, we're all stuck inside and there's gonna be, there's gonna be so many babies and they don't realize that every time you see that, you're in pain. And so I say to you, in the same way when other people at other times in your life have said things that are difficult or make you upset or make you sad, you have two choices. Choice number one is say nothing. You're not interested. It's too much for you to have a response back from them to them. You are not in a place right at that moment where you feel you can respond because it's too painful, it's too hard, whatever the reason is. Or, you know, it's coming from a person who you don't really have a close relationship with and so you can kind of disregard what they're saying. That's choice number one. Choice number two, say something. And it can be anywhere from sort of like, you know, just joking or it can be something that's really like much more um, poignant and really gets to the point. So when people start, you know, saying things like, um, oh yeah, in nine months there's gonna be lots of babies, you can say something like, actually, um, ha ha ha, not for me, I'm infertile, not happening, ha ha ha. You could do that um, if you want. The other option or some other joke like that um, or the other option is, is to pointedly say to the person and not be sarcastic and not have that joke and say, look, you know what? When you tell me that you're stuck at home with your kids and it's really driving you mad and I'm so lucky that I don't have any kids, honestly, my biggest wish would be to have children that I could take care of right now. And now I can't even go forward with my process, for my with my fertility process. We can't even try to get pregnant right now because our doctor's clinics have been shut down. And so when you say these things, it's extremely painful and extremely upsetting. So I'm begging you, don't say it anymore. Just be, you have, again, two choices. Say something or don't say something. But you have the choice as to whether you want to do that. Um, okay, next thing. Um, someone wrote in about how her husband um, is ignoring her. He seems to be totally caught up with work and he's just not really paying attention to her. I got actually, there was one person who wrote about this, but I've heard this multiple times over the number of years that um, I've been working in this field. Um, whether that's um, someone who just had a loss and the husband goes back back to work very quickly and he's just working nonstop and he doesn't like being home or so the wife thinks. Um, I've heard um, a story from um, one family where, you know, every time the husband was home, um, he just started like doing all these home improvement projects around the house and like specifically was like avoiding, avoiding speaking to her. Um, and like other, and then this person specifically wrote in saying that he's ignoring her. They just had their IVF process just failed, IVF just failed. And he, every time she tries to get him to talk, he won't talk, he won't talk. And all she wants to do is talk. And she's constantly trying to reach out to people and constantly trying to talk. And he just, he's working and working and working, shutting himself up in the other bedroom and working, 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 and hardly gives her the time of day. Okay. So here's the situation. People grieve differently. Everybody deals with grief and stress and anxiety differently. Everybody does it. 
some people burrow themselves in and get more involved in work and try to shut out the outside world and other people just want to emote and talk and talk and talk and talk and reach out to people and go on different websites and reach out to people in chat groups and 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 just all they want to do is immerse themselves in this world in the world where everyone is grieving and everyone is upset because those are the only people that really get them so you sort of have two camps it's the the, the avoiders so to speak and then it's the people who like are deeply immersed in their situation and their grief. And you know what? They're both okay. Neither one of those people are doing things the right way because both of those ways are the right way. What you need to do as a couple, as a community, as a family, what all of us need to do is to be sympathetic to what everyone else is going through. And this is what I started this all with. We're all going through something different, but sorry, let me take that back. Not true. We're all going through lots of pieces of stress, but we all handle it differently. And just because you like to talk and he doesn't, doesn't mean that your way is right and his way is wrong. Just because he's, um, you know, fixing the bathroom tiles every time he finishes his work doesn't mean that he's ignoring you and doesn't mean that he feels doesn't feel the same amount of grief and angst that you do please communicate with your partners communicate with your families communicate with each other it's okay to grieve differently just make sure that you're making space for the two of you together so that you can process certain things together but still have time and the space to process things individually those things are extremely important um okay let's lastly um talk a little bit about self-care i posted um up on the feed about a half an hour ago, now about an hour ago, a number of suggestions from um, another site. Now, the, the name is escaping me, another handle. I think it was the Mindful something or other um, about different suggestions of self-care. Self-care is the thing that is getting going to get, get let me try this again. Self-care is the thing that is going to get all of us through this. You, as a community, have been through lots of struggle and strife already. You have suffered. You have been through physical pain. You have been through emotional pain. You have had people not understand the things that you're going through. You have had people totally closing themselves off from you because they don't understand it and they don't know how to act with you. Or you've purposely isolated yourself because you're worried about what other people will say or on and on and on and on. And what's the piece that's been so vital for all of you? It's self-care. You know what works for you. We each have our things that make us feel better. And I know the messages I'm getting are, you know, here, let me, let me read, um, where is it? Here, this one. Um, I can't stop crying, what do you suggest? Um, what should I do when my anxiety gets the best of me? Three, how do, I, how do I deal with loneliness? How do I deal with any of this? Because all of my distractions are about going out and doing and seeing people and working out at the gym and going to theaters and going to, to, to shows and going just doing different events. How do I deal? How do I deal? How do I deal? Okay, you deal with self-care. There are so many things that you can do from your home nowadays, right? What can you do? You can dance in your home. You can have yoga in your home. You can cook. You can clean and organize. You can make sure you're getting enough sunlight both in your home or open your windows if you're in an apartment or go out on your balcony. Those of you who are in houses or those of you who have more access to the outside, Make sure you get outside and have that sunlight on your face. That vitamin D is going to be vital for all of you. You can journal and talk about your feelings and write them down. Sometimes just writing them down actually just releases that tension and allows you to get it out on paper and you feel so much better afterwards. 
um, you can um, make sure that you are um, doing all of the th things to keep yourself distracted in your home, even though you're not able to get outside. So that's Netflix or other movies that, that you're watching. Those are books. There are so many books I know on my shelf that I haven't read in years. And this past Shabbos, this past Friday night and Saturday, I started going through a number of them. And I was, I, I just, I it, they were like old friends that I hadn't seen in a while. And it was so comforting to be able to read some of them. Um, there are there are people you know this this all our world has turned virtual we are in the virtual space where we are um we are connecting with people instead of giving people actual hugs instead of giving them um big um big kisses and and instead of having face-to-face -face conversations instead of going out to dinner and taking walks together what we're doing is we're doing this so get on zoom get on FaceTime, make phone calls, call the people that you love and that love you, check in with them, text them, write them letters, do everything you can to keep connecting with people. Connection, 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 those pieces are going to be most vital for you. And lastly, if you think that it's just all too much and all of the different ways that you've tried to bring self-care into your life, if it's just not working and you're still crying all the time, you're having trouble concentrating, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're doing a number of these different things that are worrisome, then please reach out to a medical professional, reach out to a therapist, reach out to a psychologist or a psychologist, you need to reach out to someone who can help you. This is the reason why they're there. They are there to help you to get through this if you can't help yourself. So please reach out. Um, if any of you need help to try to find someone in your area who is doing telemedicine, I shouldn't even say in your area because at this point when we're doing telemedicine, you can be connected to anyone all over the world. All therapists have gone online. If you need a suggestion and you need help, reach out to me and I will try to connect you with someone. But please, please, please reach out if you're suffering. Um, I'm gonna end now. Does anybody have any questions, any comments, any things, any, any other things that they'd like me to address quickly before I go? Um, I'll try to come on again. Um, we'll do another Zoom, we'll do a Zoom support group either for um, loss and grief later this week or sometime early next week. And then um, and we'll do another general support. Oh, I know, I wanted to talk about Pesach, about Passover. Just one, one other, few, uh, one other um, point. I've heard from a lot of you that as Pesach is coming, as Passover is coming, that it's getting more and more difficult for you to remain calm. That all of us, as we know, we're all staying home. We're not going anywhere. And for so many of us, we have not um, made Pesach before. We don't, we haven't cooked, we haven't cleaned, we haven't shopped for Pesach. And the, the, that in and of itself would be enough. But the issue is that because we're all limited in terms of going outside, and because we're all limited in the kinds of access to different supplies, I've heard from so many people in different communities that they don't have the same access to different foods and different different items that they normally would have if you were normally making Pesach at home. And so that in and of itself is also producing a tremendous amount of stress. Okay, guys, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna do this one day at a time. I suggest that you either speak to your local rabbis or your clergy and or find different resources online for making Pesach easy. Easy, easy, easy. F there are lots of people who say, and this, this people say this all year round, or every year, excuse me, cleaning for Passover is not spring cleaning. 
This is just about getting rid of your chametz, of your leavened items, of your bread stuffs, and making sure that the surfaces and the pots and pans and the things that you're cooking with and where you're resting your Passover items are clean. This is not about taking every room in your home or in your apartment and turning it upside down. This is just about getting rid of the breadstuffs. So find the making Passover, making Pesach in a very quick and easy way. Um, talk to your rabbinical leaders about the different leniencies that they're giving for people for this year as opposed to in previous years because there are many, many, many leniencies. This is a time when this is not a regular Pesach. This is a time when it's hard to access items. Um, and thirdly, in regard to the food, we're all with our individual immediate families. We don't need two proteins at each meal. We don't need elaborate desserts. We don't need elaborate vegetables and side dishes. Generally speaking, a protein, a starch, a vegetable, maybe, so matzah, call it a day. This is about simplicity, this is about survival, and this is about sanity. Don't make it more difficult than it needs to be, please, okay? This is for all of us, and I'm talking to myself included. Myself, I'm included in this. I love gourmet meals, I love puttering around in the kitchen, I love coming up with the most intricate of recipes possible. This is not the year I'm doing it. We're talking about meat and potatoes, basically. Maybe some eggs for breakfast. And that's basically it. I'm hoping that I can get produce. And that's it. Okay, guys? So, I'm giving you all a very, very, very big hug. We're all going to get through this. I promise. We are going to get through this together. Stay here. Stay with me. We can support each other as a community and we will all get through this together. Big hugs.